Ukraine and the uh, Malinsky, Zelensky government did have a good relationship with China. Ukraine was a major source of food security for China, and it had signed up to the Belt and Road Initiative. There were, of course, issues between the two countries, but which bilateral relationship in the world does not have some kind of issues. Whatever they were, Ukraine was not engaged in activities that could be described as anti-China or unfriendly to China. There was no reason why China should want to see Ukraine being invaded. On the 4th of February 2022, nearly a year ago, Putin met with Xi Jinping before the opening of the Beijing Olympics in obviously in Beijing. And they declare that the friendship between their respective countries have no limits. And that was the 4th of February, 2022. After the Winter Games, about 20 days later, on the 24th of February, Russia under Putin invaded Ukraine. Since the invasion, China has followed a policy which I would describe as declaring neutrality, supporting Putin, and paying no price. China, I would say, is arguably the best placed great powers to booker a peace if Xi Jinping is so minded to do so. And if he had tried to play sh shuttle diplomacy and had been successful, he would have catapulted China to global leadership and would have made Xi Jinping look like a global great statesman. It didn't happen. A year on, let's review where we are with China's involvement and where it will go. But to do so, we must, of course, also take into account the perspectives of both Ukraine and Russia. Hence, we have put together this panel of experts who can share the views and perhaps debate among themselves these three perspectives. To do so, we have a wonderful uh, group of experts. And the first I would like to introduce to you is Dr. Uh, Yehinia Hobova from Ukraine herself. She is a sinologist and a fellow at the U uh, Krimsky Institute of Oriental Studies at the National Academy of Sciences in Ukraine. She works on language policies and strategies, political discourse, and Sinophone media analysis. She will be able to give us a perspective on us in Ukraine. We also have John Grittings. John is one of those pioneers who work on the Chinese military when it was not a subject of huge interest in the field of China studies. He is also a research associate at the SOAS China Institute, a very much admired journalist with a distinguished career at The Guardian. He has published multiple important books on China, and I will only mention the most recent two, which are The Changing Face of China, that came out, I think, in 2005. And then more recently, The Glorious Art of Peace that came out 2012, the year when Xi Jinping became leader of China. Also joining us is Dr. Marcin Kasimovsky, who is a lecturer in security studies at the School of Social and Political Sciences at the University of Glasgow. 
His research focused on Russia-China relations, Russia's foreign policy, great power, regionalism, and the role of domestic politics in foreign policy. He is the author of Russia-China relations in the post-crisis international order, which came out in 2015. Um, I will kick off by asking the panelists questions and we encourage them to engage with each other if they, particularly if they disagree. And I will make it very clear and we indeed request our speakers to jump in if you have anything that you would like to say that you disagree with another panelist so that we can have a more lively, open and robust conversation. I will try to leave about 30 to 40 minutes uh, to fill the questions that uh, members of the audience may have for the panelists. Please put them in the Q&A box. And if there's somebody that you would direct your questions to in particular, please say so. Let me get started. Since Ukraine is fighting hard for its sovereignty and, and security and is bleeding, let me get started not with the view from China, but from the view from Ukraine. Uh, Dr. Khobova, from the perspective of a Ukrainian sinologist, how do you see China's policy towards the war in Ukraine. Do you think China is playing a positive or a negative role in the war? Over to you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tang. Um, first of all, I have to say that I'm very grateful to be invited to this discussion. Unfortunately, it is still commonplace to discuss Ukraine without Ukrainians. And I'm sincerely honored to be able to represent Ukrainian voices here. Now to the topic of the panel, I hope to paint a brief picture of the current state of Ukraine-China relations uh, with a bit of pre-war background. Naturally, it's a quite a complex issue and I will try to include only the most important points. In the past, relations of Ukraine and China mostly fluctuated between lukewarm and unenthusiastic, and only recently with Zelensky, they were picking up a bit. There was interest in mutual trade, investment, some cultural exchange, but also quite a bit of scandals, including Chinese espionage, uh, the unsuccessful sale of motor siege, uh, grain deal fraud, etc. In general, those issues alone would not be that big of a deal if it were not for the major problem. Since 2014, Ukraine has become much more, much closer with the US. Uh, since then, Ukrainian leaders were not very keen on building stronger ties with China, uh, one of the country's strategic partners, actually, and the largest trade partner. In 2013, just before fleeing Ukraine, then President Yanukovych uh, visited Beijing and both sides announced massive plans for cooperation, none of which came to life naturally with the turmoil of Russian aggression in Ukraine. In short, Ukraine was too unstable politically for China. On the other hand, we have to acknowledge that Ukrainian politics are very much influenced by public opinion. For better or worse, but in a country with direct elections and a strong tradition of popular protest, you have to take into account how people perceive certain issues. And the popular opinion in China was never fully favorable in Ukraine, unfortunately. The reasons for that is uh, mostly lack of knowledge of China, of modern China, side of common stereotypes that the country is poor, it's a backwards country. And uh, China's growing ties with Russia, conflicting political values, and so on. And you know that the red flag with stars, the Communist Party, a dear leader, all of that brings up phantom pains for from not so distant past. Even the bare visuals of National Lianghui to sessions, for example, invoke quite unpleasant recollections among many Ukrainians. 
reminding them of their past lives in the prison of the peoples. And on China's side, there is a huge lack of knowledge of Ukraine as well. Outdated views on Ukraine, often conflating Ukraine with Russia. And in the recent decade, uh, Ukrainian society went through massive, multiple foundational changes. There is a huge gap between the imagined Ukraine and current real life Ukraine. And imagined Ukraine, I call it, uh, is the perception of the country by Chinese experts mostly, the, those experts on post-USSR independent states. For example, there is a tendency to largely overestimate the importance of uh, Ukraine and Russia's uh, common historical and cultural background, the role of the Orthodox Church in Ukraine vis-a-vis -vis Russia. All of this was indeed important in Ukraine some 50, 20 years ago, but since 2014, the annexation of Crimea, war in Donbass, and the invasion that began almost a year ago. Um, and all of that made these common grounds of thing of the past. But still, you can often see how Chinese experts describe, describe Russians and Ukrainians as basically the same one people, which is extremely offensive for many of Ukrainians. Um, and this tone deafness is unfortunately very prevalent. Uh, since February, February 24th, uh, the question of who is China supporting in this conflict was asked so many times and so many quite different answers were given. Um, with the Putin Sea meeting that took place just weeks before the invasion and the proclamation of mutual limitless support and friendship, for many in Ukraine, it was almost evident that China had Russia's back in the war. In the first weeks, we were really actively watching uh, very closely. What was the Chinese MFA saying? What was Wang Yi's reaction to all of that? And some experts were really grasping at straws, claiming that China picked uh, the side of Russia or China picked the side of Ukraine. They were dissecting and overanalyzing every phrase to find some underlying connotations. And very soon it became clear that China decided to be on China's side, at least in appearance. It looks like China is not really willing to risk secondary sanctions for outwardly supporting Russia and is not empathizing with the struggle of Ukraine enough to even send humanitarian help, uh, aside from one small batch of some supplies that they sent through the International Red Cross Society. That was in March last year. And now we even hear mostly unconfirmed reports of China sending non-lethal supplies for Russian army or sending some maybe even lethal supplies for uh, the private company of Wagner. Um, but the worst thing, I guess, is the media coverage of the Russian invasion in Chinese media. And this is not something that can be fully appreciated by common Ukrainian, but many of the more outrageous news pieces, they really still, they, they make their way to the Ukrainian public through translation. And you have uh, the Great Translation Project, for example. And in my opinion, um, the Chinese media coverage of the war is one of the greatest harms to any possible future Ukraine-China relations, if not the greatest uh, threat to it. Uh, there are misconstrued and false narratives on Ukraine. Ukraine is a puppet of NATO, of the US. Uh, Ukraine has Nazis. Uh, Ukraine has biolabs, uh, etc. And all of that is driving many Ukrainians away from China. Uh, sometimes, even quite literally, uh, we have some colleagues who were basically forced to move away from China because they felt unsafe staying there as uh, Ukrainians who are vocally supporting their homeland because they had some problems with the police. And now we see Ukrainian politicians, uh, MPs, experts, calling uh, for limiting or even cutting relations with China and focusing instead on Taiwan. And these voices are not yet the majority, but the people's support is very much on Taiwan's side as Ukraine sees uh, Ukrainians see a lot of common with it. And uh, with time, um, these voices will be growing more stronger, I guess. Uh, and um, it's something that we will have to deal in, in the nearest future, I, I, I believe. And on the official level, it is 
very obvious that Ukraine is attempting to garner all possible support from as many countries as possible, including the PRC. However, with the latter, these attempts appear to be fruitless, some even say counterproductive. Since uh, early 2021, 20, uh, Ukraine does not have an ambassador in China. And the process of appointing a new one seems to be underway, but unfortunately, it is going very, very slowly. Uh, President Zelensky made some public gestures to show that Ukraine is open to a dialogue with China. Apparently, uh, the diplomats, uh, our diplomats chose to take a moderate, non-assertive route to approach China, known as demanding or pushing China to openly support Ukraine to give weapons. Instead, Zelensky says that Ukraine is happy about China's neutral stance. And that's not something you'd expect with some European countries, for example, and understandably so. The last thing we want is China as an enemy. Um, on the more personal level, things are a bit different. There are surprisingly many people in China who support Ukraine despite this, all of the disinformation spread. Um, and we even heard about private businesses in China willing to send humanitarian support to Ukraine. Unfortunately, we have no reports of the results of, of such uh, uh, ideas. Um, so uh, one of the uh, best things that can describe uh, what China is doing right now uh, in, in Ukraine or with Ukraine is a Facebook post uh, that was posted um, uh, by the embassy of uh, the Chinese embassy in Ukraine. It was the first uh, post on Facebook on their page since the beginning of the invasion. Um, and uh, it was some mid-December. And it said, well, we know that Ukrainian children are struggling in this horrible times, and we want to cheer them up. We want to send them some gifts. So please register and we will send some gifts to them. Uh, and the gifts were like very generic um, panda bears, toys, and, and some <laughs> souvenirs which is two months uh, in uh, Russia just destroying our infrastructure. And you would think that Ukrainian children would at least like some, I don't know, warm blankets or something. But no, just, just generic panda bears that were probably lying around in boxes in the embassy anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, that attracted, naturally, that attracted a lot of uh, Ukrainian users uh, on Facebook. And the comments were, well, you would imagine not too good. And apparently someone working in the embassy, uh, a Chinese citizens, a citizen, I believe, was trying to defend uh, uh, this post. And um, there was quite a quarrel in the comments. And the person started writing some obscure Chinese Chengyu uh, with translations uh, and just that basically just sum up to, well, you should be appreciative of our support. Uh, we're doing what we can. Mm -hmm. So that's very symptomatic. That stone deafness is very symptomatic of uh, uh, Chinese actions, uh, Chinese relations with, with Ukraine for now. Uh, but in general, I'd say that um, it seems that both China and Ukraine are facing the same issue. It's like complete the sentence, friend of my enemy is my what? So uh, China doesn't want to give an answer to that. And Ukraine doesn't want to give an answer to that. And um, it's, all, it, it's a very gray area at the moment, I would say. Uh, um, and in war, it is not immediately obvious from the outside, but when you're at war, especially when you're fighting against an invader, the world is very black and white. And China is very adamant on staying in that great gray zone, which brings a lot of problems for Ukraine. Thank you uh, for this very interesting perspective from a Sinologist's perspective in Ukraine. Let me move on to you, John, and perhaps you want to engage some of, the, of, of what she has already said. But what I wanted to ask you is, what does China want? 
What does China is, want? Yeah, go on, what go does on, China sir. want in 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 the war? But why is China taking what would appear to disinterested third parties as a convoluted and perhaps inconsistent approach to the war? Um, the gray air staying in the gray zone in a black and white situation, as Dr. Hoboa explains, what is driving China's policy here? Well, those big questions. Um, I like the um, Ukraine experts whom uh, Yefenia referred to, who analyzed every phrase and couldn't figure out exactly what was going on in Beijing. I think we're all very much in the same situation. It's very hard to say what China does want. Uh, I just make a general point that we know quite a lot about China's position on most um, important questions of international relations, um, current, current issues, whether they are close to China or far away. There's, plenty, there's a fair amount of informed comment um, in both by Chinese officials and um, by Chinese academics. But if, for example, you go to the web page of the Chinese Institute of um, International Studies, um, the Zhongguo Guoji Wen Ti Yan Zhe Yuan, and look at their, um, their, their, co their commentaries, and they publish 30 or 40 commentaries a year, you'll find almost nothing of any, uh, of any substance on Ukraine. And indeed, recently, two long articles on Chinese foreign policy and Xi Jinping's foreign policy were published, didn't even mention the word Ukraine. So we're in some difficulty there. Um, but um, what do they want? I think, we, I think we can see one or two issues fairly clearly. The clearest one is no nuclear escalation and no threats of nuclear escalation. I think that um, uh, Xi Jinping made this particularly clear when he met Chancellor Scholz, but also it has been made clear in various other ways. Um, and I would uh, suggest, although we cannot be entirely sure, that this is a red line for China and that Putin was probably referring to this at the Samarkand meeting in September when he said he understood China's concerns and words that affect. Um, if you go on to look at the other things which Chinese say, for example, they, they defend the UN Charter, they often say that, but they don't say that in the, the explicit context of Ukraine. And it's hard to see how they square that with Russia having um, violated the Charter. Um, they just keep silent on that. They haven't suggested alternative wordings for resolutions which might deal with Russian concerns. They've just abstained and abstained and abstained. Um, I have to add that they did abstain on um, uh, eight years ago on Crimea as well. Um, they talk about, um, from time to time, not very often, about wanting an immediate ceasefire. Uh, they say that occasionally. There's no indication they work with other states who call for an immediate ceasefire, like Hungary or Turkey or India or Indonesia to do anything. They say the war should end with neg through negotiations. And they say they're trying to help this and they're doing it in their own way. They use the same phrase again and again, in our own way, in our own way, in our own way. We don't know what that way is. Finally, as um, Bethany has already um, mentioned, uh, they, they talk a lot about the humanitarian crisis in Ukraine, but they've only given a very small amount of aid, and that was in the first month after the war. So um, a convoluted position? Yes, I think it is. And I, would, I think I would disagree with Steve with what you said that China is paying no price. I think they are paying the price of inaction. Um, and uh, the reason for that we can, we can discuss later. Um, and, um, uh, and again, if Henry says China is on China's side, well, maybe that's true, but again, I don't think this is very much to China's advantage. I think they're hamstrung um, by um, certain characteristics of the, I would say, of the Chinese presidential rule. Um, I think Xi Jinping put them in a uh, awkward position right from the start. 
and he put himself in an awkward position too, um, as well as the um, that would be one, one, one answer. And the other answer is, as I, I think Hane also alluded, the difficulty of deciding who is really your enemy. Um, of course, uh, classic Mao, Mao uh, analysis is you decide which is the major contradiction. And the major contradiction is the United States, and therefore you support Russia. But and having done that, Putin turns out to be a pretty major contradiction himself. So I don't think China is in a regular position. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you, John. Since you raised the issue of uh, paying no price or in fact incurring cost, can I get back to you on that one first? And before I move yeah. on to uh, Marcin, the point that I was making about China paying no price as a policy was to indicate that they are not going to to do anything that would trigger secondary sanctions and therefore not supplying weapons to, to, to Russia directly, which would almost have to trigger secondary sanctions. Other, other kinds of support, non-lethal supports that Dr. Hobowaj were talking about would not have triggered sanctions. Mm. Uh, I think what you're talking about is that they are paying a price in reputational terms of their actions. But if they don't see it that way, then they are not paying a price. Would, that, would you agree with that? Well, yes. Do they see it or don't they see it? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, Xi Jinping talks about, um, in fact, the, the, I was going to quote this, the, the Bohan conference last year. He, he said that it's important for major countries to lead by example and act in a way befitting their status. There's a lot of discussion um, in China about how China conducts major country diplomacy. But this, here's an area where they very signally are not. So in, is that important to them or not? I think it's, I, I know me, means of telling, but my guess is to quite a few people in Beijing, it is important to be playing uh, the role befitting a major country and China's not doing that. Okay, thank you. Let's move on uh, first with uh, Dr. Kas Kasmarski. How does it look for Moscow? Is China living up to Xi Jinping's pledge to Putin of unlimited friendship? Does Russia want China to do more? Does that convoluted approach work for Russia? And if Russia wants more from China, what would that be? Thank you, thank you uh, for, for these questions and for the opportunity to be here. So I, I would start by saying that we don't know that much what actually Russia wants from China and how Russia assesses uh, China's behavior, because what Russia is avoiding is any criticism of China, because any criticism of China would, from, the Mos from Moscow's perspective, be admitting that something's wrong with this relationship. Um, because if I were to assess China's position, I would say that Chinese companies, especially in the economic sphere, Chinese companies seize the opportunity and they enter the Russian market, they replace Western companies. But at the same time, the Chinese state has not held a strategic supporting hands to Russia. Because whereas we see a number of uh, aspects that, that uh, testify to China's political support for Russia, it's quite often it's what, what we might call support on the cheap. Support as, as was already mentioned by John that China or NTU Steve, that China will not risk secondary sanctions. And to, a, to an extent, <clears throat> I think we need to go back to the China's response to the annexation of Crimea and Russia's reactions at that time. Because after 2014, the Russian elite was convinced and believed that China would come with total help to Russia under Western sanctions, which were compared to, to the current sanctions were, were, were quite minor. But at that time, China, has, China decided not to support Russia. There was only limited targeted support for <clears throat> specific projects, like for instance, Yamal LNG uh, exploration by, by the Russian company Novadek, which was sanctioned in the West, but China decided to, to step in and, and offer some, some help. But other than that, um, 
there was a lot of disappointment on the Russian side after, after 2014. I think it is very difficult to say what were Russian expectations in 2022, because they, as we understand the whole conflict, the whole war was premised on the assumption that Russia would win this war very quickly. And this is once again, returning to the summit on the 4th of February when they both sides uh, declared this unlimited partnership. We cannot tell what uh, Xi Jinping knew, what uh, Vladimir Putin decided to disclose, but we may assume that the Chinese side also operated on this assumption that a conflict would be a short one because the Chinese side was impressed by Russia's actions, firstly in Crimea, then in, in, in Syria. So I think that the Russian side, I would, I would speculate that the Russian side hoped it wouldn't need Chinese, the Chinese help. And after it has turned out that Ukraine is successful in defending itself, many of the needs of Russia, I would say strategic needs are not met because we, we haven't seen Chinese help that would provide Russia with means to bypass sanctions. We, we haven't seen China stepping in, for instance, to take over um, uh, the shares in Russian companies, which, which uh, the, the Western companies are trying to disinvest from. We haven't seen massive technology transfer to help with projects which we know are delayed in Russia. So in this sense, when there is this dripping of certain types of assistance from, from China to Russia, my main argument would be that China has not helped Russia in a strategic manner especially in the realms of economy and, and energy. But at the same time, it is really difficult. I would reiterate this point that as the room for debate in Russia and in Russian expert circles has narrowed down so much, it is difficult to say what are genuine expectations towards China in, 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 in the Kremlin and in broader uh, Russian expert circle. And I would stop here. How, how would you respond, Marcin, to the point that John raised earlier, that uh, Xi, Xi Jinping has articulated a no nuclear escalation position of China? I would primarily put this position in the context of China's policy towards the West, where, where this policy is still, I would argue, playing the game of bad Americans and good Europeans. And China wants to show a, its benign face to, to, to European policymakers. And the, the, the messages that China is against the use of nuclear weapons were very much tailored with the visits of, of European policymakers. And um, were, for, for me, they, were, they might have been genuine, but at the same time, they were an instrument of strategic communication directed towards Europe to show that China is trying what it can to, to help with, with, uh, with uh, not escalating the conflict. Okay. Um, I am conscious that the clock is ticking. We have got a few questions already in from the um, audience, which are very interesting. But I would like to, if possible, to go another round of it uh, before we move to the open uh, questions. But if you could give uh, slightly more succinct answers, perhaps we could move it more quickly. I wanted to ask you for, for the second round, uh, John Gittings first. With the war not going so well for Russia, what would, chi what would be China's preferred outcome by now, a year after this was what was supposed to be a very short, eff effective war had started? You said China did talk about potentially looking for some kind of a negotiated settlement. But what would China now, now like to see as the end game? What will it be prepared to do to bring about its preferred end game? Well, if China, if the establishment in Beijing is able to discuss this intelligently, and that's always a question because just to look for a moment at the handling of, of, of zero COVID, uh, there is a problem. But if you have a particular policy, um, given the nature of the Chinese um, uh, uh, top-down structure, it's very hard 
to say, let's explore different possibilities if X becomes Y and so on. But if there is that discussion, I think China should be open, I'd say should well, should be open and would benefit by a negotiate, negotiated solution, which involved um, a ceasefire, uh, security guarantees to Russia, um, perhaps uh, UN um, peacekeepers, um, uh, some sort of face saving uh, deal on the Donbass. Um, Crimea, I think, is, is even beyond that, that. That's another issue that's got that's, that's dead and gone, so to speak. Um, so I, one can see that, um, uh, in theory, uh, there's no reason why China wouldn't be, in view of what it says about um, negotiations and ceasefire and everything else and um, stopping the war, there, there'd be no reason for them not to go down that route. That would also enable them to play um, a, a significant role on the world stage as well. Um, uh, but I, again, I have to say, from my reading, fairly extensive what the Chinese do say, it's really a question of what the Chinese don't say, so we don't have any clues. Okay, thank, thank you. Let me move that on to you, uh, Dr. Hobova. Would what John Gittings has outlined as, as what China may like to achieve in terms of a peace settlement be acceptable to you as a Ukrainian? Uh, not, notably, John does not mention that China wants a security guarantee for Ukraine. He wants a security guarantee for Russia mm. and keeping Crimea. Over to you. Uh, well, as we say here in Ukraine, well, the future of China-Ukraine relations are uh, being created on the battlefield right now, on the front line. Um, the attitude of China towards Ukraine is basically very dependent on how far the armed forces of Ukraine are going. Uh, there's a direct correlation that we see in the news, actually. And uh, uh, that will define, uh, I guess, the relations and, and what China uh, wants to achieve here. I believe that China is really want to, does really want to bet on the winner here. And uh, for now, it doesn't see a clear winner in this conflict, I guess, in the nearest future, at least. Um, and uh, I guess if, the, if everything goes fine for Ukraine and Ukraine is still a country uh, in a year or two from now, uh, China will be very eager to jump in with the investments like we see in Afghanistan now. Uh, to show how China is a great supporter of, of humanitarian cause and so on. Um, and probably I will, would see uh, if Russia is still a country by the time, I believe China would still be attempting to uh, drag Russia into the G20, G8 and so on, and, and will be advocating for Russia for a while now. Uh, even if Russia faces great and dire consequences for uh, their invasion. Okay, um, thank you. Let me let me move to you, uh, Marcin. Um, how would what John outlined of a possible Chinese preference for the outcome be seen in Moscow? Would that be acceptable? Would that be a basis that Russia could look at as a uh, as an outcome for the war? I'm afraid that to put it very bluntly, you might write this scenario of a peaceful solution in in the Kremlin as well, because it aligns so much with 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 the Russian interests, and I think that this this disregard for Ukraine, which we, which we have been watching, um, uh, and one of the symptoms is this lack of any telephone call between Xi Jinping and uh, Volodymyr Zelensky. I think that this disregard is has has undermined China's position very much as as a potential broker. But w when it comes to Moscow, I think it is. I don't. I think that Moscow expects that China may not help 
in certain ways. But what Moscow does expect is that China won't, to put it once again rather bluntly, won't stab Russia in the back. And I think this is this kind of authoritarian trust that both elites and both regimes have managed to build it. Russia can be certain that China won't join the, the Western critique, that China won't side with the West when it comes to putting pressure on Russia. Right. I'm conscious that we already got quite a few questions in the uh, Q&A box. So instead of going round to a third round of uh, questions and discussions with you, I'll move to pick up some of the issues being raised by uh, members of the audience. I will try to address as many of them as we can. The first question I would like to pick is from uh, Jan Vendermaid um, from Radio France International. I'll read the question out. Hello, thanks to the panelists. Two questions. From the 17th to the 27th of February, South Africa is holding the MOSI II naval exercise in which warships from Russia and China will take part, coinciding with the anniversary of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. There was strong criticism from within South Africa's opposition, while the United States also expressed concern. The questions are, one, what is the significance of these war games? Two, how does Ukraine regard these exercises and the fact that South Africa remains formally neutral in the conflict, reframing from criticizing Russia? Um, I think this is a question that all three of you can address. But again, let's hear the Ukrainian perspective first. Over to you. Okay, yeah. Um, I really don't think these war games have any significance for the war in Ukraine. First of all, it's a Navy exercise. And no Navy is not much in action in Ukraine. And um, it's very limited. Uh, on the Russian side. Um, uh, there have been already uh, exercises, uh, joint exercises of China and Russia uh, during uh, the war, and uh, they had no effect on the, uh, on the front lines here. So it's just what it is, it, it's an exercise. Uh, and, uh, it's the first time I've heard about these exercises, actually. So uh, that speaks for what Ukraine thinks about them. It's not that significant at the moment for Ukraine. And joint exercises of Russia and China is a common thing, really. OK. Um, I'll come to you last, uh, John Gittings. Uh, Marcians, how does it look from Russia? Does the timing? carry any significance? I think it is, it is a clear signal to, particularly to the West, that Russia is not as isolated as, as the West would like uh, to, 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 to do it. And this, this is probably the biggest challenge in putting pressure, international pressure on Russia, that a number of states in the global South still keep, keep this type of neutrality and perhaps underpinned by, by certain, certain anti-Western currents in their policies, but South Africa sends a clear signal, just as India sent, sends a clear signal by buying Russian oil, South Africa sends a clear signal that it is not going to, to join the, the anti-Russian front. And I think that politically it is important. And in terms of sign Russian relations, it also eases a bit this, this pressure or this asymmetry between Russia and China, where Russia does not rely exclusively on China in, in in the non-Western world. Thank you. John, why is the Chinese Navy going so far for this exercise? Well, the Chinese Navy like, likes to do things. The Chinese government likes the Chinese Navy. Uh, I, I agree with you, I don't think it's a big deal. China will just say, okay, we'll do it. It probably means more to Russia than to China. But I think the point Martin raises about South Africa is, 
is, is an interesting one because it reminds me that South Africa in one of the UN resolutions, I think one of the General Assembly resolutions back in March last year did put forward alternative wording in an attempt to meet Chinese objections. Um, uh, the, and it, it wasn't, wasn't passed. And it does remind us too that you know, there is a large swathe of the world which is not pro-West, which is very uh, upset and alarmed by Russian aggression, but nevertheless, you know, has very great concerns about the United States uh, in particular, and does not want to be aligned with the West. Okay, um, let me move to the second set of questions where there are two uh, individuals, one so was student Josh and then Paul who asked, and that is the, the issue of Taiwan and how Taiwan fits into the picture of it. I think uh, Dr. Hoboa, you are the only one who actually mentioned Taiwan in your earlier comments. But the, uh, the main thrust of the question is about how China how China's policy towards Ukraine may or may not be affected by its policy and considerations over Taiwan. So for that, I will start with John Keating's and I'll come back to you too. Well, as with everything else, this is entirely speculative. Of course, a lot of people have suggested that Xi Jinping went along with what Putin told him last year, because the calculation was a quick victory for Russia in Ukraine would uh, give the green light potentially to a quick victory for China in Taiwan. I, uh, that's entirely speculation. If that were the case, or if some people in Beijing thought that was a possibility, what has actually happened, of course, the lack of a quick victory uh, and the enormous repercussions of the Ukraine war would have taught the Chinese exactly the opposite as it will be incredibly dangerous and destabilizing to do anything with regard to Taiwan. Okay, um, Martin, anything from, from the Russian perspective on Taiwan? I would just see here the, the growing, even before the war, we have seen uh, Vladimir Putin in particular aligning Russia's policy more and more with, with, um, you know, with the Chinese policy in East Asia and in, to, toward Taiwan in particular, up to the point where um, Putin in one of his interviews defended Chinese policy, arguing that China is not going to, was not going to use force against, against uh, Taiwan. So I would just mention that the growing reliance of Russia on China means that Russia will just follow what, what China does, mm -hmm. perhaps not to the point of providing military support, but politically, uh, I, I would see Russia accepting any policy that China decides to, to take towards Taiwan. Are you implying that in the relationship between China and Russia, China is now clearly the senior partner and Russia the junior one? <laughs> Absolutely. And it, it has been, I would argue that it has been the case for at least half a decade, but the, the, the war only has only accelerated th those processes. But 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 if you are saying that this has been the case for quite a while before the war started, then the implication of what you say is that when Putin went to China and talked to Xi Jinping before the invasion, he was effectively seeking endorsement from Xi Jinping before he invaded. Are you going that as far as that? I wouldn't probably go. I wouldn't probably go as far as that, uh, only because of um, because this would require a really deep level of trust between states, which which are distrustful by nature. I, I would say so. In this sense, I would I wouldn't exclude that that um, Russia that the Russian leader sought certain kind of China's acquiescence to, to this this policy, but I, I would still. I, I still cannot tell whether it was a, an explicit suggestion what Russia was going to do. Okay, let me move on to you, uh, Dr. Hobova, because you did in your uh, earlier uh, answer mention about Taiwan and how opinions in the Ukraine is 
changing and become less comfortable with what China is doing and much more positive about Taiwan. Now, from the Chinese government's perspective, anybody saying anything so positive about Taiwan is interfering in Chinese domestic affairs. Does that worry people in Ukraine that it will make China much more supportive of Putin in Ukraine because of the change of sentiments in your country towards Taiwan? Um, well, first of all, the Taiwan issue is the main reason that in 2014, China did not uh, acknowledge uh, the Crimea annexation. And uh, that for, for a long um, time, it was quite an important um, thing for Ukraine. But since 2022, and uh, with the recent escalation uh, with Taiwan, uh, there is more of um, emotional support, emotional understanding of the Taiwan struggles, because as I've said, uh, Ukrainians feel a lot of sympathy, uh, feel that they're in the same uh, position as Taiwan, uh, that they're resisting a huge country. But mm, in the grand scheme of things, I guess uh, the situation is, is still very different. Uh, and from the point of view of Ukrainian officials, well, we see that they're um, being very careful uh, treading these um, dangerous waters because you know, we see uh, the example of uh, uh, Lithuania um, in, in that was last year, I guess. Uh, and we really um, can't afford to have uh, such a big enemy and we really uh, have no need to annoy China to that extent. Okay. Let me move the conversation on to a very specific question uh, from Christopher Manon, and this is mostly directed again uh, to you, John Keatings. How likely is that China would supply weapons to Russia if NATO countries continue to escalate its involvement in the Ukraine war? and Russia needs conventional weapons? Well, that's speculation again. Um, my, my own view is that it would require a qualitative change in the supply of West NATO weapons, rather than just an incremental change. Um, and I imagine the qualitative change would be weapons which uh, might be used by Ukraine, whether they were intended or not, for um, large scale operations beyond the borders of Ukraine, which is probably not very likely. I think absent that, I think China will keep well out of it. Right. Uh, Martin, very quick response from you. You're comfortable that the Russians would be comfortable with John's response? Uh, I would speculate that, that the, the more difficulties Russia faces, the more pressing need for, for Chinese support will be. As, as we have seen, um, Russia reaching out to Iran and most probably to North Korea. Um, I would assume that the Russian policymakers are reaching out to China. And it is the question, what how far Beijing is willing to go. Okay. Um, would you like to come in, to Dr. Hobova, you're comfortable to pass on and we, we move on. I very much agree with John here. Okay. Let's then move on to the next questions. It's a bit rather more complicated questions from uh, Julia Cecil Rotti. And she's very appreciative of your thought-provoking presentations, particularly to you, uh, Dr. Hoboa. And the question for you is, when you look at the Chinese language scholarly literature on what the Chinese refers to as Eurasia, a policy comes up since the early moments of the fall of the Soviet Union, that is one country, Russia, two forums, Kazakhstan and Ukraine, 
implying a central role for Ukraine in China's diplomacy towards the region. Given your earlier statement on China being unenthusiastic towards Ukraine, and the knowledge of Ukraine mainly being formed by experts, will you say that this policy has been failing from the start or representing an ideal version of the region? If so, which role has Ukraine played in Chinese calculation in the past, especially after 2014? And is China's approach different today than what had been done previously? Okay, that's, <laughs> thank you for the question. Well, first of all, uh, yes, I have to say that um, uh, China's policy on Ukraine was mostly um, uninformed um, for very practical reasons, so to say. Uh, for, for a long period, Ukraine has been a Russian speaking country and that is changing rapidly in the last years. And, uh, uh, Chinese experts on Ukraine are predominantly Russian speaking, so, so they only speak Russian and they only read Russian language sources, uh, which are certainly have some bias, I guess. And I would say that uh, just that influenced a lot of uh, Chinese policy towards Ukraine, just being uninformed and uh, just repeating, uh, just treating Ukraine as part of the post-Soviet world. Uh, I'd say that's that. And for the next question, is China's uh, approach different today than what had been done previously? It's hard to say, we don't see any approach now, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've spoken about that. Um, we don't see uh, we don't see Chinese experts reaching out to Ukrainian experts. We don't see uh, we don't see any attempt to better understand uh, Ukraine. Well, I believe uh, there are people in China in, in the Academy of uh, Social Sciences and and whatsoever that that they're writing loads of articles and so on. But uh, just a single fact that. Uh, one of the, I wouldn't be naming him, but uh, the, one of the leading experts on Ukraine and China wrote a whole article um, in the end of last February, so like a week after the invasion. And uh, he wrote a huge article uh, describing how this conflict came to be and so on and so on. And in the end, he was saying that, well, after all, they're the same people they have the same culture and all will be forgotten in the end. And I will very much be saying that this is not the case. Uh, generations of Ukrainian will not be back to any uh, good relations with Russians, unfortunately. Uh, so, and, and that is coming from a very well-known now expert on Ukraine. And, uh, uh, he has changed his rhetoric a bit now that I see, but still, uh, I, I don't see this approach changing uh, in the nearest future, unfortunately. Okay, let, let me extend this to both John and to, to Marcin. For John, do you agree with, the, with, 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 with this analysis that the Chinese really are not understanding Ukraine well? Well, I, I mean, I think what, what we've just heard is um, no doubt it's absolutely true. And, uh, uh, but I also think uh, with the mention of Eurasia in the question sort of rang a little bell in my mind. I think in, in a more um, uh, theoretical sense, um, if, you cast, if you cast your mind back to Chinese analysis of the world uh, as divided into contending forces, with an intermediate zone in between. There were, one, there were a couple of articles early on last year suggesting in a rather vague way that Central Europe, or loosely defined, 
wars who could be a sort of intermediate zone. I think ideally, if the war had not taken place, um, uh, China would have regarded Ukraine as part of, as a, and, and indeed this might still be valid if China does to decide to revive um, any ideas about U Ukrainian neutrality. So um, I, I think that one could imagine, sorry, I'm getting try to be coherent, one could imagine um, China uh, sh sort of sharpening its view of, of Ukraine's place in the world and not just lumping it together with Russia, but seeing its value as an independent, intermediate actor on the European stage. Okay, thank you. Move it to you, Ma Sinj. If we are looking at the Eurasia and Ma Central Asia in particular, Kazakhstan was being mentioned. Um, countries that Kazakhstan is, is not exactly very comfortable with what Russia is doing in Ukraine. Um, the Chinese are cultivating Kazakhstan. Are the Russians comfortable with that? Probably not, but at the same time, Russia has little choice. And when it comes to Kazakhstan, we have seen quite a dynamic around this 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 country because it, in January 2022, it seemed with Russia's uh, military intervention at the request of of uh, Kazakhstan president, it looked as if China was losing ground in, in Kazakhstan. Whereas after uh, Russia's invasion in, against Ukraine, Kazakhstan seems to be moving closer to China with China being very, very specific about, about uh, Kazakhstan's sovereignty. But this would, this would lead me to, to the fact that I, I would disagree with Yevhenia that, that there is not much between China and Ukraine because my argument would be that China may, has made a significant strategic choice but this, with the silence on, on, the, on the war something which, which China hasn't been doing to, with regard to any post-Soviet state. Because if we look at China's policy towards the post-Soviet state, China was always ex has always been explicitly unwilling to, to admit the Russian sphere of influence. There was always, China has always attempted to keep the ground for, for its um, especially economic um, policy. And, if we compare before 2022, if we compare uh, China's policy towards Belarus and Ukraine, excellent political ties with Belarus haven't converted into good economic relations between China and Belarus. Whereas even the lack of trust uh, of the, on the part of the Chinese government to all post-2014 Ukrainian governments have not prevented China and Ukraine develop their relation, economic relations with, with China becoming the largest partner. But I would argue that this has changed with, with, with this Chinese silence. And this is the first that obvious choice that China does not say it, but acts as if it considers Ukraine to be genuinely in, in Russian sphere of influence. Okay. Let's move on to the next uh, question, which comes from Martin Wheel. It's a hypothetical question, but um, let's put it anyway. If the Russian regime should collapse, will China respect the geographic integrity of Russia? John. <laughs> I, it's, it's a long time since China laid any territorial claims to the Soviet far, far east. I think one would, that probably is going back a, a, a little too far. Um, uh, I think it would be a great um, uh, problem for China um, because Russia, uh, even, even if Martin is right and China is the dominant partner, you know, Russia is an important counterweight on the world, on the world scene and China would have to rethink its, own, its whole strategy. Um, but I think the answer is no. Okay. Sufficiently reassuring for Russia, Marcin? I think that the a regime collapse will be would be problematic even would not necessarily open any opportunities for China. It would rather much more complicate Russian Chinese relations because firstly, any change of of of, uh, of the regime means or even the change of a of a leader means that a new leader 
has the opportunity to rethink Russia's policy towards China, and Russia's relations with China, and Russia's dependence on China. And he or she might choose to tread slightly differently. And secondly, there is still, we can, once again, it's only speculation, but in the case we, we would see the nationalist and liberal coalition against the current regime, it would also be, it, it might very easily become anti-Chinese with the perception of uh, the current uh, regime in, in Russia being too reliant on China and uh, making political favors towards China in return for, uh, rather than pursuing uh, good economic deals with, with China. Having said that, any, this, any warning voices inside Russia are now, are now silent. So, so in this sense, there, is not, there's, there are no debates uh, in Russia which would uh, speak to any fears about Chinese potential expansion. Let me extend that uh, Martin's response to you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Hobova. Is the apparently increasing dependence of Russia on China something that will be seen as a positive or a negative from, from a Ukrainian perspective? Uh, personally, um, I don't really see uh, this overwhelming dependence of Russia on China. Uh, we see that uh, Russia is for now at least self-sufficient and what they're trying to, um, to achieve is more of the outward support of China uh, from, from the Chinese side in this conflict and, and just in general. I believe that uh, Russia is uh, uh, trying to uh, more more to show off their great relations with China, and with that to lure in China with closer relations and support, and so on, and so on. As for the regime collapse, I really wanted to <laughs> interject here. Uh, as a Ukrainian, as a salty Ukrainian, I'd say uh, I really much hope that. China does not respect geographical integrity of Russia. But unfortunately, I don't see it really happening. OK, thank you. Let's let's move on. Um, next question comes from Bernie Howley in the, the UK. The question is, and this is mainly directed against you, uh, John, is the general population of China aware of all that which is going on around this conflict? Or are they being kept in the dark in the nature of the relationship between the leaders of China and Russia and the resulting policy around the Ukrainian invasion? Actually, I think in a way, uh, Yechen is, is better able to answer this, but she, has, she did indicate in her opening remarks that uh, there were people in China who supported Ukraine, which means she's tapping tapping into a vein of, of opinion there, which uh, you know is not um, certainly not available to me. I mean, on the face of it, um, uh, no, the Chinese population in general do not have, have have much of an idea, and you can understand why because of the you know the the, the way in which the, the news is being um, uh, cabins and about by Ukraine is being confined and, uh, um, and, and, and limited. But I think we have to uh, be cautious here because, again, I refer to, to um, COVID uh, and the demonstrations not long ago, um, it, which are a reminder that actually a lot of Chinese know a lot more than we, than, than when we might think they are able of learning. Uh, they, find way, they find ways to find out. Um, so, uh, but I'd like, very much like, like to hear what uh, Evhenia has to say on this. Over to you. Um, okay, um, of course, the general population of China is not very well informed in what is going around in, in this conflict and this war. Uh, but all is not that bad as it seems uh, sometimes from the outside. And we are keeping in touch with our friends and colleagues in China. And um, me and my fellow Ukrainian sinologists, uh, we have a small project of translating Ukrainian news from Ukraine into Chinese and publishing them in um, some 
uh, platforms that are available for Chinese uh, netizens, um, WeChat, uh, Faisal, uh, what have you. Um, we see that there's not much, uh, there, there's not great audience there because um, these resources are unfortunately restricted and we are trying to stick to those that can be used through VPN. Um, but um, our mission has been to provide this uh, source of information from Ukraine and uh, that is coming not from some um, unknown journalists or bloggers or bloggers or, or whatsoever, but from the actual sources of the news, like uh, Ukraine Forum, Onyan, and other uh, um, news agencies of Ukraine, from, from official sources. Um, and this information, it does spread quite a bit. Um, and from, uh, from anecdotal evidence, we know uh, that many of the intellectuals, so to say, of the uh, people who are professors maybe, or maybe students. Uh, so they have an interest in the conflict and they know not to trust fully the Chinese sources on, of information. And they are actively seeking out uh, alternative sources. And they sometimes happen to find um, our translated materials or they are looking at, say, BBC in Chinese or Al Jazeera or other major news outlets that publish their news uh, in Chinese also. So, um, unfortunately, uh, I would say the larger portion of the population does not know that much about the conflict and only consumes what is provided by the television. Um, and the social media as well. Uh, but there's a significant portion of people who are trying to seek out this information and hopefully they can reach it. Can I, pu can I push you a bit here? Are we talking about the Chinese population being uninformed about Ukraine or are they unsympathetic to Ukraine? with Russia being a familiar Greek power that they know much more about, that um, until at least certainly the fiasco, the, the mess that Putin created, the image in China of Putin being a strong, effective leader of a country that was in decline and was being revived under his strong manned leadership. And therefore there was this sense of more positive sentiments towards Russia and less towards Ukraine. Which is it? Well, I can say uh, that the general public is really unempathetic, even though they're not pro-Ukrainian, actually support Ukraine, um, even when they're not fully informed, they still have a lot of sympathy for Ukrainians, uh, for just daily struggle, so to say. Uh, there's just so much uh, visual circulating on the Chinese uh, internet uh, with uh, bombed out cities and uh, people's struggles, people's stories. Um, there's a tendency for these stories to reach out to the Chinese people far better than just the news of how many people uh, died and how many people survived in the recent rocket launch. But um, the emotional part uh, of this conflict is very much grabbing the attention of many uh, Chinese people, I believe. And uh, uh, for that matter, I'm really grateful that our current president has uh, passed in, in the in entertainment business because a lot of the PR, so to say, mm. uh, gets through even to China, despite mm. all the filters, despite all the suppression of the information. Uh, there are so many strong images of this war created here and uh, just uh, circulating in the internet that they somehow still get through the great firewall. Okay, thank you on your remark about the great communicator your President Zelensky. Um, let me move the uh, these discussions on. There's a 
question that I'm going to put to you, but I'm not quite sure who amongst you would feel most comfortable with. And the question comes from an anonymous attendee. And the question is, what do you think lies behind media reports of US warning China against providing non-lethal weapons or non-lethal support to Russia? Who, who would like to take on that one? Well, I'll take it on in a negative way. I mean, I'm not really, I haven't followed this. I don't know how much discussion there is of it. Um, I would make a general remark that we know very little about the back channel dialogues, which must, which I hope going on between Russia and United States and China and the United States and China and Russia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, journalists, I'm afraid, have been, in my former profession, have been very incurious about what seems to me the, um, the one of the most important aspect of this crisis, uh, this war as of any war, which is what is going on behind the scenes. There are clearly restraints and restrictions which are understood. Um, uh, you know, for example, uh, to give you an example, you know, Russia, as far as I know, uh, has not attacked um, the military supplies coming into Ukraine from outside. They haven't hit the, the by whatever means of transport they come in. Um, and we've talked about um, um, our supposition that China has put up a red flag on nuclear weapons. Um, but the, the dialogue, which there must be between Russia and and the United States, I certainly have, have, have no feeling for at all. I'm not sure who does, if anybody. Um, maybe Martin does. Martin? I, I would rather have... Oh, and including the, the, the a response perhaps to, to John's point of Russia will not um, a, attack the supply lines outside of Ukraine for Ukraine. Perhaps that will start Turn, turn, turn the war to become a war with NATO. But your, your take on that. So, so I actually want to extend, in a sense, the question to, to, to my fellow panelists. Uh, how much uh, successful the US position is to, uh, in a way, to name and shame certain, uh, certain Chinese behavior and to warn publicly China from doing certain things. Is it working better when the US does it in the public, or would it work better if the issue would have been kept under the, the radar, and and the US would send only those behind the behind the closed door signals? So this is for me the, the, the biggest the biggest question. Okay, that leads very well to the to a question being put by Paul, which is about uh, is China watching to gauge Western responses? Does it matter? Does the China Chinese worry about what the Western countries are doing about in Ukraine? John? Uh, well, just to respond to the point Martin made, uh, it's quite true, of course, that China, um, from the American point of view, uh, you don't want to send public signals to, um, to, to Beijing because that will put Chinese backs up even more and will uh, you know, encourage the sort of 110% anti-American uh, faction in, in, in Beijing, so it should be done privately. My point was simply that uh, I think journalists should try to find out a bit more about what's going on, um, but it should be done privately, certainly. Uh, do, 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 so the question is, do, do Chinese mind what is said about them? I'm not sure whether that is by governments or by people. Are they aware and sensitive to public opinion? Um, I mean, I have noticed, for example, over the last year, that Chinese ambassadors in, uh, in, in Washington and also in Europe tend to try to say more emollient things or to put things in a more emollient way. So I think they do, but then there are two tendencies there because that's, again, there's that tendency to try to put a good face on it and try to win over Western opinion. Um, then there's also the, the wolf warrior tendency, which says um, we, we couldn't care less what people think. Um, so I suspect that in Beijing, uh, this is um, a contentious issue. Okay, anyone want to come back on that? If not, let 
let's let's move on. It's a, a question that comes from somebody who again would like to stay anonymous. Does China really want to be the world's policeman? Uh, the questioner feels that this conversation about China's actions would be quite underserved without discussing the road and actions of the United States. Do you see in any way how China's approach to the Ukrainian war as indicating that China either wants to be a world policeman or not wants to be? Um, Dr. Hoboa, you go first, perhaps, uh, since you you are most affected. Yes, okay. I really believe that China does intend to be the world police, but not in the way, um, uh, not um, the way that the US is um, seen as the world police. Um, they really want to be the world police behind the scenes, at least it looks like. Um, um, uh, but still, if uh, China, I believe it, it wants to have the same level of power and influence as the US, uh, but doesn't want to position itself in, in that place. Uh, that's a, a short answer to that. Um, okay. And I believe that China has actually taken steps to that, but we don't re always see uh, these measures and uh, uh, the, their actions towards that. Okay. John, I'm not actually coming to you next. I will come to you. Um, but I want to, to, to go to um, Marcin next. How does it look from Moscow's perspective? Do you see, the, do the Russians, does Putin see the Chinese wanting to play a world policeman's role? If so, will they welcome that? I, I think that looking at the experience from, from, from uh, sorry, I, so putting it briefly, I would say no, that China, from the from Moscow's perspective, China doesn't want to, to play a world's policeman role. And moreover, it doesn't want to play a role of a major pillar of, um, how to put it, rebuilding the world. Because if we look at two, two, two cases of uh, Russia trying to pull China into the rebuilding of Syria, it has ended with, 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 with nothing. Mm -hmm. Russia attempted to portray it at, at a certain moment, Russian experts also portrayed Russian-Chinese duo as Russia uh, providing the, the military muscle and, and China stepping in with, with economic support, but we haven't seen economic support for the, for the uh, Syrian regime. The, the other case was, was Afghanistan, where China presents a nice face, but we haven't seen a massive influx of Chinese investment in, in Afghanistan. It's rather Afghanistan is this kind of deadlock of, of the BRI. So I would say that the perception is that China is not willing to and is not ready to pay for a genuinely major role in the international scene. Okay, John. Mm -hmm. And this, this question open, opens up to a huge area. Um, let's one begin. Well, 20 years ago, Chinese um, foreign office officials would say to me, it's better to be number two. And I think that is, for a long time, that was certainly the sort of the Deng Xiaoping approach as well. Um, being, a, being the world's um, uh, main uh, top power and being the world's policeman is bad, is, is bad luck. We don't want that role. Um, I think that uh, under Xi Jinping, uh, one does see a very significant shift um, in certainly in uh, in the terms of um, in rhetorically, um, and yet it clashes. Uh, and yet it clashes with what China says at the same time about the, the world they want to see, where all relations are consensual and there are no superpowers, and we all get on well together. Um, I would say this is um, this is an unresolved question, uh, as one I think of many, in, in, in Beijing at the moment. As far as Russia is concerned, I just add that I don't think the memories of Russia in the past, and the sign of difficulties, are in, entirely gone. And if, if Russia 
continues to make a mess of the war, or as one president suggested earlier, actually the, re the, the regime falls, the, then I think um, China would say, well, that just shows uh, your big mistake in no longer having a communist party in charge. Okay, thank you very much. We got, I think, two minutes left. I would like to put to you all one last question. And if you could give a very short 20, 30 seconds kind of answer. Um, I will again go with you first, Dr. Hobova, being in Ukraine. And the question is quite simply, what do you see your country wanting in the coming year? Very short, punchy answer to that, please. Oh, that's very easy. Um, victory, <laughs> I guess, and that's just it. keeping our territorial integrity. That's all. Okay, thank you. Marcin, what would Russia or Putin want for 2023? Russia would like to achieve a breakthrough in, in its war against Ukraine and secure any kind of victory that Putin can present to, to the Russian society and to the Russian elites as, as affirming his, his policy. Thank you. Pretty clear and straightforward from the two countries involved in the actual hostilities. John, China, what would China like to see in Ukraine 2023? They'd like to see a magic solution which would solve all the insoluble problems, which I think are causing them to scratch their heads in Beijing and leaving them in what I regard, and I think many people in Beijing would regard as an unsatisfactory position. Um, uh, just possibly, they might like to see or be prepared to engage in negotiations um, if enough international steam uh, got going for one. Uh, after a stalemate on the battlefield. Okay, thank you all very much for your very thoughtful comments and the discussion. Um, because we are ha having a webinar format, we cannot get everybody to show their appreciations to you. Um, but nonetheless, your contributions are very much appreciated. And I do apologize to anyone if his or her questions in the Q&A box has not been filled to the panelists. And please be assured that all your questions have been copied and they will be put to all our panelists after the event. So they will know exactly what your questions or comments are. And thank you for joining this webinar. It is my duty to draw it now to a close now that we are one minute beyond our officially allocated time. Mm -hmm. I look forward to seeing some of you at our next webinar. Good night and goodbye.